it is uh, one of the sins of uh, European history, but it's also a sin of every other empire throughout history, be it the, the Mongols or the Russians or the Aztecs or uh, whatever. And often what the Europeans uh, conquered were local empires and, and uh, who had their own colonies and their own slaves. So, I mean, no one escapes blame for history's atrocities. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to Worldview. I'm filling in for Pietrus. Pietrus is currently on my show filling in for me. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today we're talking with Johan Norberg. Johan is a Swedish author and historian devoted to promoting classical liberalism. He has authored many books including In Defense of Global Capitalism and Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. Johan is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and executive director at Free to Choose Media, where he regularly produces documentaries for US television. Johan, good morning and welcome to you and welcome to your cat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, be kind, Sansa, we've got an audience now. Hey, please behave. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. A pleasure to be with you. So, Johan, um, you've probably been asked this a million times. Um, especially with the rise of Bernie Sanders and being a senior, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute based in Washington. But are countries like Norway, Sweden and Denmark socialist success stories? I hear that a lot. And it's interesting because when you look at, for example, my country, Sweden, um, we had an experiment with socialism. We tried that in the 1970s and the 1980s when we were already one of the richest countries on the planet based on a 100 year episode of very open and free markets. Then we had lots of money to distribute. And that's what people still remember. They remember the 1970s when we doubled the size of government, we jacked up uh, taxes and regulated almost everything. It's like, you know, it's like another Swedish phenomenon, ABBA. That's what people remember, the 1970s. That's when we, um, we were famous for various things. What people don't remember is that it failed. This experiment utterly failed. This period, those 20 years, were the one instance in modern Swedish history when we lagged behind other countries. We did not create a single net job in the private sector, and we had complete wage stagnation. And it all ended in a terrible crisis in the early 1990s. And then Sweden and the other Nordic countries also began to reform and liberalize their markets again. And compared to many other countries, um, for example, uh, other European countries, including, and including South Africa, we are now much higher in economic freedom rankings and free markets uh, in, in Nordic countries. So it's time for people to update their perceptions, I think. And I believe it was, uh, I can't re remember a prime minister of one of those countries that actually said, we are not a socialist country. When Bernie Sanders said Scandinavia have socialist countries, we are not a socialist country. We, 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 we reject that. Yes, that's right. I think that was the Danish prime minister, Lars Lekker Le Rasmussen. But you can even go to a social democratic prime minister uh, in, in Sweden, the former social democratic prime minister, Joram Persson who said that uh, when people asked him, do you call yourself a socialist? And he said, oh, no, I would never do that because you, you get uh, confused with so many crazy people. And I think also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe one of the reasons why people are so fearful to label themselves as socialists, especially in a country like Finland, is that they had to deal with a lot of wars with the Soviet Union. I mean, they don't want to label themselves as socialists. No, that's right. I mean, the historical arch enemy for Finland and for Sweden is uh, the Soviet Union and, and Russia. So obviously that's the great fear and we have to stay far away from any association with that. So, um, so the social democrats in uh, Nordic country very early on said that, no, they're not socialists. They don't want to socialize the means of production. They want to get some of the spoils through taxation, but always keep in mind that we need private enterprise, we need open and free markets, because that's where we create all the wealth that we can redistribute later on. 
And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard another rumor that many of these Scandinavian countries have fiscal problems, that the interest on their debts are becoming somewhat unsustainable. Is, is that quite a problem in many of these Scandinavian countries? It is a problem because when you have large entitlement systems like social security, pensions, things like that, you pay into the system as you work and you get it when you stopped working. And unfortunately, this means that it's very vulnerable to any demographic transition of more older people, fewer young people. We have the same thing in healthcare. We have the same thing in many of our, our welfare uh, systems. And that's something that has historically resulted in very large difficulties for, for our countries with high debt, high interest rates. In early 1990, Sweden, we experienced a period when the rest of the world basically stopped lending to Sweden because we were in such a bad place. And we had to increase the interest rate, the central bank, to 500%. Wow. Not, five, not 50, to 500% to get anyone to want to invest in Sweden. Um, but at least in Sweden, we, we learned from that and started to reform some of these systems. So the pension system in Sweden now is based on more on uh, not defined uh, benefits, but on defined contributions. So what you get out depends on how is the economy doing. And we also pri particularly privatized it with individual accounts. So reforms are going on. And if we can pivot to another country that's very important to the African continent and South Africa in particular, that is China. And um, we it's, it's so important actually to South Africa that we recently found out that a member of parliament in South Africa spied for China. That is how important China is in, in, in the African continent. But many of the communists and socialists in our country say, forget about the United States. So uh, uh, China is doing so well. It's, it's a socialist country. We should adopt socialist policies. So is, is China's success based on socialism? Is China a socialist success story? It's interesting that you ask this question when uh, the problems in the Chinese um, housing market and the state-owned enterprises seem to be, might be about to unleash havoc on the global economy right now. Uh, and that tells you something important about China, which I think many lose sight of when they want a one-dimensional answer to this question. China is a mixed economy. It's it's mixed because it's got fairly ruthless free markets in many areas, but it's also got these old state-owned enterprises and based on government borrowing, which has increased rapidly in the last few years and very large um, infrastructure projects. So what created the, um, the health, the, the success story of China in the past 30 years? Well, it was the fact that they began to dismantle the command economy. And that didn't happen from the top. I know this is the popular story now in the communist, the, the Chinese Communist Party, but also around the world that we have those wise planners who sort of nourished and guided the economy to success. That's not at all what happened. What happened was that local villages basically said, we are starving with these communes and without being able to uh, do private business. So we are secretly privatizing our land. It was so secret that they even promised one another that if word ever got out, uh, those who do not end up in labor camps because of this privatization will take care of the kids of those who do end up in those camps. They started to as small village enterprises and what the Communist Party did under Deng Xiaoping, and this was his great wisdom, was that when he saw that this was already taking place and everybody wanted to do this, that it was a success story. And instead of putting them in labor camps who were pioneers, he said that, oh, okay, I guess this is better than starvation and misery. So let's allow more people to do the same things and then experimenting with it at the margins of the Chinese economy, like, for example, the export processing zones. That's where we saw the great multinational Chinese productive companies being born. So all of this happened outside of the plan, outside of what was expected or even predicted by the Communist Party. And that's where we got all the growth in 
new employment, in exports, in wealth in China. So capitalism is the reason why China was so successful. I, but the problem yeah. is that once you are that successful, you can also afford some major mistakes. You can afford some of these large scale uh, state owned enterprises that basically just destroy resources all the time. And that's what we're seeing as well. And now there's a faction in China in control who want more of that, want more of government industrial policy. And that will not be a success story. That will be utter failure, I think. So, so the socialist policies are actually holding the country back, and it's based on capitalism that they succeeded to the degree they have. I mean, if they embrace it more, they would probably be growing even faster. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there are things like they call economic zones, free economic zones in China, in a place like I believe in Shanghai, and not a lot of people know this, but in a free economic zone, you pay almost no tax whatsoever, and there's almost no regulation whatsoever. That's correct. And this is the thing that uh, created this rapid uh, transition in the Chinese economy. The Communist Party said, oh, look, it seems like they're doing something wrong in the local villages uh, when they're toying with, with private business. And they also looked to their neighbors, to Singapore, to Taiwan, and realizing capitalism seems to be very efficient at creating wealth. So perhaps we should allow some of it. But they didn't want to um risk the whole plan and that's why they didn't implement these free zones in uh sort of the, in the in beijing or in one of those major cities they took small places like the old fishing village shenzhen close to hong kong for example just thirty thousand inhabitants but once they were so free Enterprise exploded and people moved there. There was massive uh, migration to these places. So this old fishing village that had 30,000 villages now has almost 10 million inhabitants. And so in other words, the, the, the planned economy couldn't survive such a great success story. So they had to implement some of those policies in the rest of the economy as well. Uh, just for interest's sake, when they calculate the, the index of economic freedom of a country, do they factor in the free economic zones? Because obviously if they don't, that number can be very inaccurate. That's right. No, it's a, it's a lot of complicated uh, uh, measurements where you have to look at so how large a proportion of businesses are affected by these laws and other laws and taxes and, and, and no taxes. So that's, that's difficult. And uh, I don't know if someone has done that completely accurate uh, just yet, but yeah, it comes close to it. Yeah, it, it, yeah, perhaps I should study more of those data that they use for the index of economic freedom. But another country that is underrated and a global figure is, is India, and it's it's a main opponent to China. I, 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 not a lot of people talk about India. Do you do you believe? What is your opinion on the the economy of India? And do you think it's possible that India might one day eclipse China? I definitely think there is that possibility. Just a couple of years ago, I did a documentary called India Awakes, which looked at some of the similar things that were going on in China in the 1970s, how they were happening in India right now, how villages began to secretly privatize, to do business, to trade. And, and India has done quite a lot in opening up its economy. Uh, but they did it 10 years later. Um, China started in the late 1970s, India started in the early 1990s. So um, they are a little bit behind when it comes to these things. But I think there is a chance that it will be more sustainable in the long term, uh, precisely because of the what people think is a more chaotic uh, Indian uh, uh, the, system of uh, many different localities and uh, different points of view and well the the chaos of democracy so to speak because it means that they are not completely dependent on what a single ruler thinks uh, if xi jinping wakes up one day and thinks that oh the tech sector is too big then he destroys it and that's the end of it and now he's in some sort of maoist persecution of successful entrepreneurs everywhere and that can only result in misery i think there is a chance that the greater personal freedoms in india will protect uh, 
uh, more of uh, private initiative and uh, individual creativity. And I mean, it's a country that's still growing. Its population is growing while it is declining in China right now quite rapidly and the, the workforce is getting smaller. So if I had to bet long term, I'd, I'd bet on India. That's interesting. So basically because India has a more federal system, it might have a better chance in the future. I think that... There's a greater chance that India will allow trial and error to go ahead, whereas at least with the present system of Xi Jinping's um, personality cult and very authoritarian centralized system since around 2013, um, China doesn't allow that. One of the reasons why China was successful was that they actually learned from the Maoist period, even in the Communist Party, that, okay, we should allow different opinions within the party. And when we change our mind, we can change policy as well. Uh, because when you have more of an anonymous collective leadership, no single person loses face. Um, but Xi Jinping, it'll be very difficult for him because he's the savior and the, the guardian of everything. Can, can he ever be wrong? I don't think so. So if he makes major mistakes, he will continue to do that. Whereas the back and forth and the uh, divisions between the center and the uh, states in India and uh, uh, the normal procedures of um, the, a chaotic democratic process with opposition parties and, and so on, it makes it more difficult to adjust your course if you make mistakes. Mm. And, and I mean, you just have to study Roman history to know you, you only need one emperor to screw everything up. But um, Johan, many people are now blaming the state of India and Africa on colonialism. They say the Europeans came, they stole all the resources. That's why India is struggling at the moment. That's why Africa is struggling at the moment. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman said that uh, colonialism wasn't really that it wasn't very, very economically um, sustainable. It wasn't beneficial to the European powers. Is that true? And then why, why did the European colonize? Why, why did they go through with colonizing the world? Well, I, and I share that perspective. That's the, my reading of, uh, of history and the economic analysis of, of what went on. Uh, it was incredibly costly for societies at large to uh, to do this to build their armadas and to fund all these projects the infrastructure the military that it took to and often wars uh, to make this happen but a few people benefited there were a few people a few monopoly businesses and politicians who reaped enormous rewards so they wanted to do this to extract resources and to monopolize trade and and they did it and they always done that unfortunately this is another reading of history as well this is not a european phenomena whenever a country or a region has grown dominant economically technologically militarily it has started to conquer other parts of the world uh, so it is uh, one of the sins of uh, European history, but it's also a sin of every other empire throughout history, be it the, the Mongols or the Russians or the Aztecs or uh, whatever. And often what the Europeans uh, conquered were local empires and, and uh, who had their own colonies and their own slaves. So, I mean, no one escapes blame for history's atrocities, unfortunately. Um, so it benefited a few, they wanted it. At, when you look at the whole of society, at the economy and uh, the taxes they had to pay, I think it's fair to say that it held uh, societies back. And one, one uh, piece of, little piece of evidence of that is that uh, European countries grew faster after uh, they, um, they abandoned uh, colonies. And places like Sweden, like Switzerland, uh, countries that never had colonies or an empire grew at least as fast, actually faster than, than the others. So I don't think that really explains it. However, in some areas, it might explain why it created long-term problems for the colonies. But then it's less about the resources that were extracted, because we've also learned from history that having lots of resources might actually hold you back and, and create a political struggles and, and fights rather than productive um, um, businesses. Uh, 
but oftentimes it destroyed institutions that were there. The, um, the private property, the free markets, the free trade that went on regionally were destroyed by, um, by um, the uh, colonialists. The problem later on was that when the liberators then um, made their countries independent, instead of returning to the idea of, of really liberating markets and men, they took over the colonial structure. They become their own occupiers of their own country and continue mm. to extract resources and monopolize trade and destroy it. And, and we've, we see that those countries only prosper now when they begin to do, abandon those policies. So it's really all about what you're doing now rather than your reading of history. And probably one of the biggest mistakes of colonialism is the artificial borders. That is one of the biggest, um, that creates the most problems on the African continent. And um... no, absolutely. This is one of the great uh, horror stories. When I read a Ghanaian economist like George Aite, he explains how people didn't care about borders in pre-colonial times. I mean, it was not always sort of uh, uh, the freedom and free markets, but but people traded across large uh, areas, specialized and and created uh, great businesses. But when the colonialists entered, they created this arbitrary border. So suddenly it destroys not just freedoms, but also people's economies. Behind suddenly arbitrary borders, you're shut in and you can own and then you have to become self-sufficient in, in various ways and anything that can be done in opening up trade and creating tr free trade agreements in Africa is incredibly important for its future. The, what was the main reason during those times do you know why they wanted to stop colonialism because because I know for example the Liberal Party in the United Kingdom granted South Africa independence and it's it was quite unique for the 19, I think it was like 1906. So why was it because they they didn't see this as financially sustainable? That's one of the main reasons why they wanted to end this. Yes, and this is really the interesting thing when you talk about European colonialism. It's not unique in to the extent that uh, the moment Europeans were superior, they tried to conquer the world. The unique thing is that in many places, uh, by they decided themselves voluntarily that let's just abandon this, let's move out. That's unique in history. Usually, you're you're thrown out by by violent means. And one reason is that ever since the mid 19th century, there had been a movement in European countries like Britain opposed to colonialism and empire and uh, often from the classical liberals and from a combination of the humanitarians and the free marketeers who said two things that first of all um, we engage in atrocities uh, over there that we would never accept back home so it was really uh, the idea that this is a uh, we, we break the human rights that we take for granted back home, but also that this benefits a small uh, aristocracy of monopolists and uh, corrupt officials uh, at the expense of others. Why should we fund these uh, military interventions and wars on the other side of the planet just to benefit a few back home? So partly an economic argument. Okay, well, I, I wish that was taught more in... Um... And then class in African countries, especially in South Africa, because we don't know anything about this. And yeah, obviously it's so pertinent. But um, with the divides in society, it is useful to know of non-political ways to solve our problems. I mean, we, we can, I mean, I'm a libertarian. I believe you are a libertarian. We, we would love to see our policies carried through, but without a mandate, that's not going to happen. So do you, do you know of any non-political ways of how we can solve our problems. For example, I know Milton Friedman proposed a negative income tax. Perhaps another idea will be replacing the welfare system with a universal basic income. Do you, what is your opinion on that? And what do you think is almost non-political ways how we can solve today's problems? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good question. And I think in a way we are constantly solving uh, problems like that, uh, but spontaneously in on the market and in civil society, constantly trying to come up with better ways of creating uh, security and um, ensuring ourselves against uh, risks. So what can what can the government and what can policy uh, learn from that? Well, one of the major mis problems of uh, the welfare state, I think, is not really what it costs. That could be a problem. It might put us in a place where, we, uh, where we're all much, much worse off. But I think the worst problem is not what it um, costs, but what it buys, what it creates, the kind of dependence on, on the government and on uh, welfare that uh, is often the result. Because that's not a good place to be. That's That's terrible. I, I traveled around the US uh, a couple of years ago to talk to people who live on, on the public's expense, on, on welfare, and they all said two things. Uh, they said, it's horrible. Uh, I feel completely useless. Uh, and the second thing is, I have no idea how to get out of this. Because the problem is, yes, we all want to help people if they end up in, in unemployment, in a difficult situation. But if we do that by handing them um, resources that they lose the moment they stand on their own two legs, the moment they get a job or a raise. Well, in that case, they, they face a very high marginal tax. And uh, around the in industrialized countries, uh, people who are unemployed face a, uh, more than a, a substantial number face more than an 80% tax basically on getting a job. In that case, you are left out. So what can we do about that? Well, you've mentioned some of, of these ideas, some way of handing money rather than uh, in-kind benefits to people that are not automatically deducted from what people make themselves. So that there's always some sort of incentive to, um, to get that job and to and to try to work harder and to move to the place where there is a job and i think that the uh, universal basic income could do that however it's also an incredibly costly way of often funding the middle classes and even the rich so it might not be the, the best solution I think. but can't you limit it to a few years for example you only get it for like five years and it's not concurrent that helps absolutely so any way of tweaking that that universal basic income would help quite a lot and and you could also sort of at very high levels begin to um, uh, reduce it and uh, what i find interesting in mitlam friedman's uh, negative income tax idea is that this is built into the system that it's autom automatically a little bit reduced the moment you get your own uh, an income of your own, but not too much so that it will always pay off wherever you are. Anything that turns the welfare state from creating passivity and staying back home on the couch and turning it into an incentive to become independent is worthwhile. Mm. And I mean, if, if I can just in a South African context, I believe the latest numbers, we have 90,000 people living on welfare in South Africa. I mean, com compare that to the population size, it's not even close to the United States. I mean, it's, it's really a massive problem in South Africa. But if, if we can pivot to your very fascinating book, uh, Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future, a lot of people, especially the youth, are concerned about climate change. And, and in your book, I believe you put forward the idea that the, even in climate, in climate change, if things are improving, right? Things are not as negative as people perceive it to be. So uh, how is capitalism solving today's climate change problem? Yes, I'm also worried about climate change and it is a, a major problem and it could uh, result in, in uh, nasty consequences, both for nature and for uh, for humans. Uh, but I object to the idea that uh, this is, well, I, I basically I object to two things. First of all, the idea that, okay, then it was a problem with growth and uh, industrialization because it creates these these problems over there. In a way, that's true. 
We wouldn't have these emissions of carbon dioxide if we didn't have uh, 200 years of rapid economic growth in, in uh, certain parts of the world. But then we would still die young. Then 40% of, of kids would die before their uh, fifth birthday. We would still have extreme poverty rates around 90% around the world. So doing this, industrialization was a way to reduce the biggest problems that were killing the most people at that time. Well, now we have a new problem based on this. So let's try to solve that. How do we do that? Well, some say that let's start dismantling the, the economy. Let's not travel and fly across the world and send goods uh, in, in container uh, around the world. Well, actually, we just experimented with that. That's really what the pandemic was about. Uh, unintentionally, we shut down the world. We stopped flying and we blocked uh, production, mobility, trade around the world. Um, and the result was terrible because probably some 100 million people were thrown back into extreme poverty. But how much did it reduce carbon dioxide emissions around the world? By 6% no more than 6%. So if we were to reach the, the Paris Climate Accord targets until 2030 by um, reducing the size of our economy of growth, well, then we would need uh, to have one pandemic like that every year until then wow. without any uh, comeback in between. So that's clearly not the way to, to do it. What's the other way? Well, that's to keep on growing, keep on creating, but doing it in a greener way with less use of fossil fuels and uh, of, of uh, energy based on fossil fuels. And actually, that is what is going on. And that's why I am hopeful. We've seen a rapid uh, efficiency increase in our energy systems, in our economy by ev every year we reduce our, our energy intensity by one to two percent. Uh, so far, that has not been enough to reduce carbon dioxide emissions on, in the, on the whole world because lots of populations are growing even faster. But some 50 years are already reducing their carbon dioxide emissions now, not because they're decline, uh, reducing the size of their economy, but because they're moving to more efficient systems and using other energy sources. And we have more of them. We have so many that are now... Uh, being experimented with and are being rolled out. It could be new forms of solar power or new forms of nuclear power. It could even be uh, uh, sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into rock like they're doing on, on Iceland right now. Um, all of those things are possible. They're still a little bit too expensive to roll them out everywhere, but what do you do when something's too expensive? Well, you don't say, let's abandon growth and technological progress. You're saying more technological progress to reduce it in price and more growth so that purchasing power increases around the world so that people can both send their kids to school and move to a, um, a more green technology. Yeah, I believe it was AOC and a Green New Deal proposed that we should stop all air travel. And I mean, like you, I believe we should do something about the climate, but that's just madness. I mean, and but correct me if I'm wrong, many of these problems mainly originate from countries that are more socialist, like India and China. And it's mostly to do really with poverty. It's not really to do with uh, privatization or companies. It's really poverty that's the problem with um, sending, um, I, I can't remember, the uh, uh, damaging the climate. That's right. Uh, in, in several different ways, that's uh, absolutely true. And one of them being that, uh, I mean, poverty is the worst polluter, as um, India's Prime Minister Indira Gandhi once put it. Uh, if you are uh, desperately poor and you, you don't make the investments in modern technology, the things that would reduce uh, energy consumption or move to better sources, but also... Um, <laughs> And this is a great bizarre irony. Some of the poorest countries that have the least resources, they also subsidize the, the most polluting technologies that are out there. We have around the world some $320 billion being spent of taxpayer money spent on subsidizing uh, fossil fuels and uh, 
and fossil energy because you know it's a way to become popular as a politician you hand it out to to the poor and uh, obviously that's that's the first thing we should do do first do no harm don't subsidize the things that are that are heating our our planet and some would obviously say well look if you stop subsidizing it it'll be difficult for the poor and they need petrol for their car and so on yeah sure i i agree that's that's a problem but in that case i would say stop subsidizing those industries and those resources and hand those 320 billion dollars to the poor just hand it out to them and see if they're interested in buying fossil fuels or something else. Hmm. Yeah, but usually there's a very close connection, and we see it in South Africa, between socialism and corruption. And any way they can get control in the state, they do it. But in your book, you, you mentioned a very interesting notion that we are much more intelligent today than we were about 50, 100 years ago. You, 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 it's called the Flynn effect. Can you explain to our viewers what is the Flynn effect? Yes, this is a very complicated topic, but since we're all getting smarter and your audience's IQ levels have been rising uh, recently, I'm sure they'll understand what is going on. Uh, this is an interesting thing that a New Zealand scientist uh, found out a couple of decades ago when he looked at old IQ tests. And what he found was that... Um, and it's not visible at first because they are always standardized. So whatever is the median basically result is put at 100 IQ points. But when he looked at how complicated the tests were, he found out that they were getting more complicated all the time. And when you used a modern IQ test and gave it to um, um, people doing it in the 1960s or 1970s, they would do much, much worse on these tests. So what was going on is that slowly and steadily and almost unintentionally, the researchers were making their tests more and more difficult to continue to make sure that it always ended up at 100, 100 on uh, in, in the median result. So what Flynn, James Flynn, uh, who, who's uh, uh, the uh, game name to this Flynn effect pointed out was that, it seems to be rising. We seem to be getting smarter, quite contrary to everything that we're hearing always about the, you know, the youth, present youth and the, the young generation, they're hopeless. Uh, well, they always seem hopeless because they don't know exactly the same kind of things that you were interested in when you were at that age, but they are interested in, in other things. Uh, but when they do IQ tests, they perform better than the older generations did at their age by around one point uh, per decade or, or something like that. And he, there's been lots of speculation. Why is this? What is going on? And one of the more, most counterintuitive uh, and therefore one of my favorite hypotheses is that it's got to do with popular culture. Um, popular culture has become much more difficult in a way. Look at the TV series we watched in the 1960s or uh, 1950s and uh, pretty simple plots and a few characters and you know who was good and who was bad. Uh, now it's complicated. It's hundreds of characters and you might not even know who is the uh, major character. Game of uh, Thrones. Exactly. And they have to make them more complicated to attract attention and make it interesting for us. But that also is that's like gymnastics for our brain because we constantly have to think about what is going on and keep track of more complicated things than we used to. And obviously work life is like that as well. It's not as easy manually as it used to be. So it seems like there's something in modern culture that gives us mental exercise all the time. And um, so uh, what is your general opinion on IQ scores in general? Do you think it's a reliable way to judge a person's intelligence? <sighs> Uh, that's a good question, and I'd say it's it's the uh, worst one uh, we've got, except for all the others, uh, because it is limited. Uh, it's very much about a very abstract form of intelligence, of finding patterns that really don't make much sense, uh, but it's our way of trying to look at cognitive ability in itself, which is a bit like the the capacity to get capacity in different areas and to uh, study something new and learn about it. But obviously that doesn't capture everything. We all know about the sort of the 
the confused professor who don't know the name of his kids and uh, doesn't remember to put his pants on, but has very high IQ. There are other areas of capacity that you need as well. Uh, but I do think it, it correlates quite well with how you do in education, in, in work life and so on. So I'd say on average, it's, um, it's useful, even though it doesn't say everything. Mm. I, I love your re reference sort of to Winston Churchill there. He, he also said about democratic elections, it's the best of the worst systems we got. If, if I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, but that's basically what he said. But in your book, you give a lot of reasons for us now to be optimistic. But is there one thing that might crush your optimism, right? For example, AI, world governments, I know the UN or, yeah, well, the, the European Union, we have the European Union, Union, here at South Africa, we have the African Union, they want to expand their powers or massive debt. Is, is there something that might crush your optimism? Uh, I wish you wouldn't ask me that question because it's so depressing <laughs> because obviously it's not automatic. I'm a, a qualified optimist. I think that when people are free, to experiment with new ideas and knowledge and to experiment with that in new business models, technologies, and, and, and exchange the result across borders and trade and investments. We create marvelous results and we solve more problems than we create uh, all the time. And that's why we've seen this uh, in the last 30 years. We've reduced extreme poverty around the world by three quarters. We've reduced child mortality, illiteracy, um, child labor by half. It's it's a wonderful world, but it's not necessarily the case that we will always get that freedom because there's always the temptation from the powerful, from the monopolists, from the bureaucrats, from the politicians, uh, authoritarian leaders to take a quick route to their own power and success by uh, reducing our, our freedoms. And that has often happened historically, so we shouldn't rule that out uh, back home. Right now, I can see um, at least two uh, great risks that would um, be problematic. One of them is power grabs in themselves. There's always the temptation for anyone with power to lay their hands on more of them. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, in the European Union, I think it's a great idea to have the, the four freedoms of um, people, goods, services, capital across Europe. It's it's wonderful example of institutional competition. People can move to what's best. But once people in Brussels have that power, <laughs> they want to extend it to other areas and begin to standardize and rule and control. And, uh, and I'm sure there's uh, similar there are similarity in the uh, it's in the African Union. You can see that anywhere that people when they think something is for the best, they want to make it mandatory and they want to control it. And the moment you make something mandatory and centralized, you block all future progress because progress is always dependent on millions of people being allowed to experiment through trial and error, feedback, adaptation, and new experiments all the time. And the moment someone says, I know the one way for everybody, that that's, destroys it. So that's one area where I'm, I'm fearful. We should be deeply suspicious about power everywhere. The other one that you mentioned was debt. Um, it's fascinating that global debt levels have increased dramatically since the global financial crisis. Mm. That global financial crisis in 2008 was based on us having borrowed too much and making stupid mistakes with those resources. Well, since then, what we've done is that we've reduced interest rates even more. Central banks have pushed out liquidity everywhere in the economy, and we've all borrowed even more than we did back then. This will at some point uh, end with, with a bang, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, it will be difficult. The, we need an adjustment uh, to sort of asset prices coming down, debt levels being reduced. But the problem is that crises often result in more power grabs. It often results in, in fear, a societal fight or flight instinct. It could be sort of a great recession. It could be a pandemic where we all want to be protected by that strong man or that big government. So it could be a combination of these two things that makes me quite worried right now of both 
debt levels and um, and big governments. Hmm. I, I hear what you're saying, but we, we've had a, a, a famous libertarian and economist in South Africa, Davi Ruet, on our show a few times. And Davi has said that debt isn't that big of a problem in the world because if you just take the United States, for example, the Federal Reserve, he says, the Federal Reserve and the United States state, they owe each other. So it's entirely possible that one day they're just going to say, okay, this was fun and everything. Let's just wipe the slate clean. Let's just get it back to zero. And he says a lot of companies like Google, you, you, they are not factored into the economic growth of a country like the United States. So it's entirely possible that we are growing faster than we really think we are. So he says good times are going to continue. We, it's entirely possible that the era of great depressions are behind us. And it's only going to be the high road from here. Is, is, is he onto something there? I hope he's right. And when I feel particularly optimistic, uh, then I, I, I buy that argument. And I do think that there's definitely a case for saying that productivity and growth rates are really faster than we think it is, because it's we have measurements to that are great to measure how much wheat or steel we are producing, but we're very bad at measuring how much value is a search engine or the capacity to have a digital map that explains where to go at any point of time. We don't measure those things accurately and therefore we underestimate the wealth that we're creating. So perhaps debt levels are a bit smaller than we think. But I too think there are two major risks, even though that might be the case. First of all, we it's just like we experienced in the US housing market and the debt securities that were based on the housing market the last time around. We really don't know where those debts are. And I think for a very long time, we've now kept so many businesses and so many projects alive that should have been dead by now. Zombie firms that have survived only because interest rates have been so uh, low. So there's lots of, of debt that have gone into destructive um, capacity rather than anything else. And we'll, we'll be in for a surprise when we realize where all those debts are, I think. Uh, the other thing is that when we when everybody wants to borrow, nobody wants to own capital because that doesn't make any sense. You, you won't get much money if you put it in a bank account or anything like that. People move to strange places uh, with their money. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it means that you invest in eccentric business models that might pay off in the future. But sometimes it means that you've gone and bought... Uh, Iraqi government debt and you've uh, ventured into very exotic obligation bonds that you have no idea what they're really tied to. The economy That's right. There. So lots of those things will blow up, I think, when, when the, cri the crisis comes. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think, okay, there's obviously that that is a problem, but generally they, uh, comparing us to 100 years ago, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic, but it, it, it seems like it's difficult to sell that message. It's, it's generally difficult to sell optimism. And I see a connection between libertarianism and success and optimism because libertarians ultimately preach individual responsibility. And I mean, you're not, you're not going to take responsibility if you don't believe you can be successful, right? So it's, why do you believe it's so difficult to sell the message of opti optimism, success, and ultimately libertarianism? I think you're absolutely onto something there for, for many reasons. Uh, optimism and libertarianism is connected. And one of them is that the government, <laughs> by just implementing something and through force, they can show a particular result. Look, we have created these 5,000 jobs through this particular project over here. So whereas freedom delivers in the long term, because it's unexpected, it's based on the idea that this politician doesn't, cannot predict the future. Uh, it can only happen through the uh, creativity and innovation of millions, billions of, of people around the world. And then it will deliver in the long run, because uh, even though many will uh, not 
come up with great business models, technologies and vaccines, a few will, and they will improve the world. So we're improving the chances that we will see progress when we have freedom. But it's not immediately, instantly visible. It takes a little bit of a, a leap of faith, <laughs> uh, a certain hope in the future. And I think it's firmly based in history and uh, economic science, and we can, we can prove it. But in our minds, it's not visible, it's not present, it takes some hope, some optimism uh, to, to see this through. And, and that's difficult because our, our psychology is, is short-sighted and it's, it's based on what we do here and now. And one of the difficulties I find when I preach progress and optimism is that I can point to all the triumphs we've had before the diseases that we defeated, the, the poverty, the, the, the child mortality, uh, the fact that we've gone from life expectancy around 30 to 70 years around the world in, in the last two centuries. All of those things are amazing, but they're not present. They're not here. People don't think about it because for obvious reasons, we have to think about present problems. So nobody cares about polio anymore or the fact that we defeated most scourges. Uh, we're all worried about the present pandemic. Uh, nobody is, is, is happy about life expectancy increasing from 30 to 70 years. Now they're afraid that it might fall, de be declining a, a year or so because of, of this pandemic. And yes, we, we have to be concerned about present problems because that's how we solve them after all. But it means that we forget what mankind is capable of. And that's why I think we, we need history to remind people of uh, the immense progress that we are capable of the moment people have a certain degree of freedom. Mm. And uh, do you, don't you think it's also a degree of insecurity, especially amongst the youth? Um, and with insecurity, you don't want complicated answers, right? You want demons and angels, right? You, you want almost to believe that there's bad guys out there. You don't want this optimistic message because that means you, you can't ventilate on social media. And I mean, it, it's optimism doesn't sell to the younger generation as well if you're so insecure. Yes, you know, D uh, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, he was a very close friend of Rousseau for, for a long time, the French uh, thinker. And Rousseau was depressed and he hated life and he was miserable. Uh, and David Hume said in a letter to another friend that, look, he's just miserable and secure and he's a sad guy, but he wants to blame society <laughs> because he doesn't want to face up to his own demons. So instead he wants to sort of paint uh, a whole of society and history with this broad black brush uh, because that's, then it's good. Then it explains why you wake up in the morning feeling awful, that it's, it's society's to blame and the world is to blame. So uh, it's probably something, uh, he was probably onto something there. I, I think in, especially in a, it feels like we live in an uncertain era, but every era felt unsafe and uncertain, obviously. But we forgot about that because we knew that we didn't die of, in a nuclear war back then or from from polio or the Spanish flu. So now it feels uncertain. And when it's uncertain, yes, you want the good guys and the bad guys, you want certainty. And especially I think uh, with social media and the internet, which is wonderful, but it comes with a problem. This instant access to any kind of information anywhere makes the world seem even more confusing to, to lots of people. It seems like there it's, it's more unpredictable than ever. And when the world is unpredictable and uncertain, you begin to long for someone to give you that one answer, that one true answer that explains everything. And that's a very dangerous temptation because what if that answer is wrong? Yeah, a sort of a messiah figure that, um, yeah, like a Bernie Sanders that, oh, it's just, we haven't followed the policies of Scandinavia. But Johan, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. I don't want to spend any more of your valuable time. So I want to give you one last opportunity to add plug or say anything that you want to or answer a question that you thought, I, I hoped I'd answer or ask you, excuse me. Oh, thank you. Uh, would that be, I think, Yes, in, in that case, I'd pitch something that I, I've just been doing right now. 
I love free markets and capitalism, um, but there is something that's, that destroys it. And that's when capitalists aren't capitalists, but instead they play politics. And instead of competing over having the best, best goods and services and coming up with constantly better solutions, they come up with constantly better contacts and connections with politicians. Uh, and instead of uh, offering something that we want to pay for, they want to put their hands in our pockets and just, just take it out. And we've seen that in Sweden, we've seen that in the US, we've definitely seen that in South Africa in, in recent years. And this is dangerous in two ways. First of all, it destroys our economy, but also lots of people blame this on capitalism and free markets, even though it is the opposite. This is actually, this is the case uh, for, for open markets historically from Adam Smith and others who said that, no, it's not that capitalists are always good and act in our best interests. It's that they aren't and they won't unless they have to. And it's actually oh, free markets that forces them to do that. Otherwise, we could give them a monopoly and regulations and a safe, uh, secure place. Free trade and free competition, that's our way of forcing them to always act in our interest, because otherwise they will die. Uh, and I just researched this issue in, in the US. Um, so I made a documentary called uh, uh, Corporate Welfare where the outrage that documents this in, and it's available online on YouTube and, and other places, uh, but it's definitely not limited to the US. And it's an issue that I think that everybody who believes in, in freedom and in capitalism has to take seriously. Mm, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely gonna go and watch that documentary. But uh, to our viewers, if you've made it this far, please consider liking this video, uh, sharing it as widely as possible and subscribing to our channel. My name is Donald and this has been Worldview.